Hello everyone. Now, before we get to this video, I want to shout out Blitzap, who's created this very generously decided to support my YouTube channel. I know what you're thinking. The league's been out 10 years. You've got your own solution, the websites you go to. Blitz is different, and let me show you why. I recently cast a game where Tarzan popped off on Lee Sin. So, clicking on Lee Sin in the client, you'll notice that Blitzap loads up Tarzan's rune page. Already, you're like, okay, this is nice, tell me more. Blitzap is the only app that can auto import Tarzan's rune set straight into the client. Loading into the client, you'll notice opening up the shop, you've got Blitz's suggested jungle item set, but there's more than that. These are recent pro builds loaded of very notable players. You can jump in and play Lee Sin like Tarzan does. And I hope this quick run through shows you the Blitz app's doing a little bit differently and it's seamless and awesomely integrated. You can download the Blitz app at blitz.gg. Links are in the description below. Final review of the night. Let's live at the light for just a moment. G2 Esports versus Splice. Always fun to get to the LEC and I love matches between teams that are really different, that play the game really differently. G2 Esports and Splice could not be more different. It feels like every stat you look at, they are going to be oh so different. Average game duration, 27 minutes, nice and short. For G2 Esports, 35 minutes. Eight minutes is a long time in League of Legends, and that is the difference in their game times. Both teams doing pretty well, as we can see. But you see how the teams play. Kills per game plus deaths per game equals the bloodiness stat. So in an average game for G2, 30 people are dying across the two teams. They only play 27-minute games. So there, there's 1.1 persons dying every minute in a G2 esports game. You look over the side of Splice, 35 minutes, 23.9 people die in, on average, 35 minutes. Therefore, we're talking about 0.61 or so people are dying per minute. So we're like almost half the amount of people are dying per minute in Splice games compared to G2 games. Push and pull, push and pull, push and pull. That's the reality of G2 versus Splice. You look at their stats and they're both in the green. So whatever they're doing, they're doing it pretty well. That's for sure. But... You can look over stats and you just start to pick up on things, you know, at the end of the day. For example, look at kill participations. 46% for Wonder. Best Western player and not even 50%? What the hell? 60% for Vizachachi. Does that mean he's better? No, it means that they're very different. Wonder likes to play solo pushing style. G2 likes to play three lanes. And so they're not grouping for team fighting very often at all. Like, that's just a reality that these two players are very, very different. You look at, for example, bot lane. 70% on both players compared to 62 and 69% for Perks and Mickey. That's because when this guy is getting kills, this guy is in his pocket backing them up. They play very much around knowing their strength mid to late around team fighting and Kabe being the one to, like, knock down the dominoes. Whenever you're... 80 carry has the highest uh, kill participation or are basically the same as your number one member, you're a team fight team more often than not. And that is the reality of how Splice play the game. But G2 want to blow up the map. So that's why this is so exciting is that G2 Esports, when they win, they blow up the map. And by that, I mean, it's not about just like you push it in and then I push it in. No, like they are very assertive about attacking multiple lanes and trying to get things that come st unstuck in transition about getting priority in multiple lanes and then finding out what more they can get. Oh, we have a pushing top side. Can we dive it? Can we get four plates? Can we catch someone when they try to counter gank it? That's what G2 is always about. Meanwhile, Splice much more are about how can we make this game more predictable so that it slides into a later game state where we know how strong we are, we know how strong they are, we have a good warding pattern, we have a good way to play the game, therefore, we're just going to be so smart and so clean about closing it out. So it's chaos versus control 
kind of in the same vein as SKT versus G2 was billed at in MSI. But the chaos part is the best team in the world, the winners of MSI. And that makes it oh so vibrant when they play. But it also means that Splice's draft against them is so hard to fully understand. How do Splice keep G2 predictable? They want to know all the lane matchups as early as possible. Where's the prior? Where's it not? They want to go to their analysts and like really keep G2 in a box. G2 breaks through boxes like the Hulk Hogan ripping open his shirt or something. So that's why this was always going to be a super intriguing series if Splice is in a good spot. And look, they're coming off a win off Fnatic. They're coming off a really strong ebb to their season. And that means that this was very likely to be a super interesting game to watch. So we zoom forward in terms of pick ban. I think they had some pick ban issues here from memory. Debated. So. So you can see from the bans already, like Splice really wishes they could have five bans against G2. So they could just make this game as straightforward as possible. Mordecai's a band away. I guess they had some intel that G2 was going to play it. And G2 seemed like the team that could play it, Mordecai in five roles. So they banned that away. Olaf to stop Yankos from rampaging. We've already had an Olaf review where we can see what's possible for an Olaf in the early game with FBX popping off against IG with early game Olaf. G2 are very much in that same sort of style of wanting to take games over in the early game and blow them up. So ban away the Olaf. Suddenly most tank junglers can take some semblance of an even matchup because Olaf is banned away. They ban away Pike because, well, it's G2. So... They don't want to deal with that. It's definitely an old school ban, it feels like in some ways. I'm not sure why they're banning away Pike on 913, but that's what happened in this particular game. They don't want to deal with any bot lane shenanigans. So, But then if you look at G2's side, what the bans come in? Well, they get Azir, safe wave clear, Karma, safe priority, and Aatrox for strong skirmishing. So... It is very much chaos versus safety, even in the bands that are coming out. But I definitely think this Mordekaiser and Pike is kind of a strange red side band duo. One or the other, I think, with one more normal band might have been the way to go. And G2 band Kiana, which because of it being um, G2, you're pretty expecting this to be caps, but it could also be multiple lanes. Now, the first thing I don't agree with is first round of Lux and Silas, because Silas is taken with no junglers banned other than Olaf. Now, Olaf is his worst matchup, so it's probably fine, but this is very high Silas priority when you don't know the matchup. Like, usually when we see it in the LCK, it's a counter to Sejuani um, or another level 6 jungler, but taking Silas blind is... Like it doesn't always do something. Like You need a lot of variables for Silas to be a great pre-level 6 champion. But if you're against a, a predictable level 6 champion like Skarner or Sejuani, then you're fine with Silas being competitive at farming next to um, a jungler like that. So I think it's a bit curious to see Silas this high priority, but it's a bit of a quirk of the LEC where the Silas priority has been a little bit higher in the LEC, and people in chat are also referencing that as well. I'm not a huge... I'm, I'm just saying from my perspective, I don't see it because I can see other ways for, this, for the draft to go, but it's not, a, it's not a bad pick. It's just a surprising pick to me. Meanwhile, Lux is seen, and then you get Gragas Yasuo locked in. And you almost always... I, they say this on the analyst desk, but you're almost always expecting this to be a bot lane choice. In Korea, when we had first pick Yumi, Genji would took Gragas Yasuo first round. We forecast it would be bot lane. It was bot lane. Lux also has the same struggles against um, Gragas Yasuo. And Gragas Yasuo really makes it hard to play almost any enchanter support bot lane. If you don't have multiple winning lanes elsewhere on the map, you actually find it really hard to run this lane because 
Lux is really good against tank supports in terms of having crazy lane presence. We call her the two turret play champion in most normal lanes. Against Gragas Yasuo, you might say, okay, it's two melee champions, probably going to be double range, aren't you fine? The problem is the all-in potential for Gragas Yasuo pre-6, around like level 3 or 4, is enough to kill Lux more often than not. And Aftershock's not going to save you. If you don't have like vertical jungling happening and also control ward vision to always know when you're safe to walk up or not, you're actually kind of free food for Gragas Yasuo to just all in you in the bot side. So given how G2 like to play with multiple lanes with priority pushing up and then finding picks on the aggressive side in those lanes, I actually am a big fan of, of the Gragas Yasuo lock here. Also, Mickey is a wonderful support Gragas and Caps is a, sorry, not Caps, a Perks like a legendary Yasuo in multiple lanes. So it is a flex, but you look at this and think it's surely Kiana mid lane Gragas Yasuo bot lane, but you still don't know. And that's why this spot is so hard. We already build this as Splice is the comp. Splice is the team that wants to know all the information. You know, they're kind of the hypochondriac where they're like, all right, like what could happen here? And are you sure that my, my al allergy medicine is in there? And can you give me all the details about what our itinerary will be? Meanwhile, G2 are just kind of the cool kids who are like rolling with the punches, but like they've been working out. They know they're pretty strong. So when you're in this spot and you have to work out an AD carry to pick, like you look at the enemy team and you're like, hmm, it's an assassin and probably Gragas Yasuo bot lane. Already Lux is going to have a hard time. If you go Ezreal in this lane, you like the, the win wall just gets so incredibly high value that it's pretty hard to pull off the lane. You kind of need a dash to try to deal with the all-in here. Otherwise, your flash being on cooldown, you die two or three times to an all-in. So you need a dash champion. Of those being left, Lucian is kind of the, the medium choice that gives them some lane power um, and is a bit kind of more offensive than the Ezreal choice that Yasuo can largely deal with. But... It doesn't really help them with teamfight scaling as the game goes on. And the item build path here is not, is not clear. Like, I think you have to take the Lucian because all the other picks don't really fit. And yet, because he's a mid-ranged AD carry against strong Wombo engage, you're still not sure. But the frustration is nothing else is safe because you still don't know for certain that Gragas Yasuo is going to be bot lane. So it's another symptom of the different ideologies between the teams is you know every single champion's role on this team as it's locked in support jungle mid ad carry because chachi is not really a top lane carry player so at the end of the day everything here is known to g2 everything here is what g2 decide based on the lineup that actually is put together Victor taken ends up being a blind pick, but it's a blind pick that has priority on most of Chachi's champion pool. Like if you pause out and think about what Chachi's likely to play, he's had Poppy and Nar banned against him. So you're thinking basically GP. If not GP, then maybe something like the Nico. So the, the Nico, which would be a bit more competitive against Victor, but not priority. Cannon loses priority in the matchup. Karma is banned. Like, Chachi is a player who is very well known. Like, he's had the same um, he's had the same reputation for a long time. Nico Band, good point, chat. So you've kind of forced him into probably GP. And you also expect GP, because like we saw talked about in our last series where um, on the red side, FBX took down Caitlyn Lux and they wanted to play bot side. The GP was taken to Cannon Barrage the lane. Like, GP is what you heavily expect as the last pick here, if you're G2. Like, you're thinking, oh, it's probably going to be GP. Let's just take Victor and have push priority in the lane if it is Victor, if it is GP. And that's what we get. We get GP in this scenario. And it's like they herded, you know, they pushed, um, they pushed him into picking the GP. Now, when you think of the lanes here, um, it's priority top side for G2 early. Obviously, Lucian and Lux will be strong, but this lane turns really hard based on one jungle gank or one all-in. 
if they trade up in that, then it's sometimes these champions can't even really enter lane 2v2. So I would say earlier priority is there. The mid lane matchups are really intriguing one where I think Akali um, in a side lane at level 6, I think actually has quite a lot of kill pressure onto Kiana. Um, but Kiana also has some similar parts to her kit in terms of decreasing damage and stuff like that. So, I mean, it is double assassin mid lane. My instinct is uh, favored for Kiana early and then maybe super late, but Akali Gunblade is, is the usual kind of strong point for him. So this game ends up being about a Baron that G2 get for free, that Splice can't get to, and the free Baron is what decides the game. There was a lot of chatter about, how could you ever give up a free Baron? That's just a mistake. But what I kind of wanted to focus on for this VOD review is jungle pathing and trying to fully understand how the free Baron happened. Was it really just like Spice's brains turned off for two minutes and the Baron was lost? Or was it something that was building up through the game that eventually paid off for G2 with a Baron? That's kind of the most interesting thing about this particular series for me. So it's going to be what I'm focusing on when it comes to the early game. If you notice, Spice do not have any forward vision. G2 do not either, so it's a shallow jungle start for both, and they're both level 6 junglers. And remember that Sejuani was picked into the champion that's considered to be her counter in the LCK. Like We saw so much Silas being answering Sejuani in Rift Rivals that Silas was banned to get Sejuani picks. But in this particular game, we are seeing instead the Sejuani taken into Silas because Sejuani still has good synergy with Gragas, Yasuo, Kiana, any melee champions, there's still kill pressure in the lanes she goes to. So that's a good thing to know about the scenario. Right now, Sejuani is very much on a safe start. Sejuani is going on a start to just be able to take both big buffs. Won't go buff to buff. You see that sometimes if the enemy jungle scenario is really scary. Meanwhile, Xerxes is going on a full clear top side. So Zerse is naturally going to path bot side, which I think is correct. I think that what you want to do as the Silas this game is to show up about 3 to 315 bot lane and just put the fear of God into Mickey and Perks. Because you pause the game, the moment these guys get access to all their skills, level 3 comes in, there's so much outplay for Gragas plus Yasuo. Consider the advantages Gragas and Yasuo have. They have Exhaust, Ignite as their summoners. So when we had Mordekaiser plus, um, you know, double Bruiser bot lanes, like we had Mordekaiser Orin for a while, one person takes Exhaust, one person takes Ignite. So they had the double kill pressure summoners. They have ranged all in with E Flash from the Gragas. Yasuo can also engage from time to time. Now, Kobe has a heal from the Lux, but that's all they have. The ability to actually hit the binding on someone, if you're going to be entering the fight pre-6 with E-Flash on the Gragas is actually pretty minimal. Like, it's very hard to hit Binding against this duo when there's outplay, both from something as simple as the Wind Wall, but also flashing over the, the Binding, and then Exhaust Ignite, you're dead. So it's very, very hard to play this lane if there's even summoners, because it's two combat summoners compared to one, and that doesn't even give Kabe the full benefit of the... The heal. So because of that, Silas wants to come down and either they want to control the minion wave and threaten them off turret, kind of like we talked about in our first review, like trying to threaten away a Tomkench Sona and get a turret plate for the range lane, or you want to look for a dive on this lane. That's what you want to be doing as Silas, because otherwise you're not showing any threat in the bot lane, which is your most gankable lane early. Akali and GP have no gank assists, so you really desperately want to be showing bot side to try to make something happen. So as I goes to spot, he gets the news that bot side is cleared. That means that a bot lane turret dive or zone away would have been free. 
But you'll notice that Xerxes actually spends his time instead returning to his blue buff. So he's not there to counter gank for mid lane, and Humanoid just dies. Caps playing Ignite mid laner. Really good tanking by Caps here. I don't think many mid laners take three turret shots for their jungler. If he doesn't, Diankos dies. What I was noticing in the early game quite a lot was moments like this, where Splice, if they want to make the guarantee to trade up play, they have their jungler go to bot lane and threaten Gragas and Yasuo off of a minion wave when it's being frozen. Like, that's the play that I expect the top team to employ here because they guaranteed get something. Do they get a kill? Do they get a summoner? Do they get five minions denied from the... Gragas and Yasuo, like, it's just a sliding scale of great. Like, there's no bad scenario there. You're not even afraid of um, if the Sejuani is going to be there because the moment this play happens, the moment that um, Silas stops counter-ganking around mid lane and checks out, like, the moment he sees this, you know for a fact that Sejuani is going to be topside. So now... Going straight through, straight down, and either contesting the Krugs or, want, like I mentioned, zoning away the enemy duo lane is pretty free. Like, they know he's topside. There's even a ping on it, right? Like, they're pinging out the Sejuani is definitely topside. So, Xerxes is pathing bot lane to zone away is free there, and it starts off that toll of Perks and Mickey having to repel a lot of aggro from teammates. The fact that it doesn't happen here and that Xerxes backs off, like Xerxes decides to go to blue, and that ends up being super crucial in this game because Humanoid, the wave is in an awkward spot. He wants to fully push it. He has more minions, so he wants to push it in. He's going to overextend for it. How many times is Caps all in someone on Aurelia, Akali, etc. on Assassin picks with the minion wave at this spot? It's happened so much, and to me... The reason why I think this game was about more than just how did the free Baron happen was we just now have discussed a passage in the game where Xerxes could have been counter ganking mid or could have been going for a proactive gank bot lane where Spice gave no respect to there being a counter gank from the Sejuani. They were almost certain Sejuani was top. And instead, he doesn't cover his mid lane of pushing in and he doesn't threaten bot lane. So... Two dozens don't make two wrongs don't make a right here. It makes a non-action, and G two find a pretty nice gank in the mid lane. Like it was hard. Like this requires a lot of execution. Caps staying to take the extra turret shots is the only reason it's not a one for one. But this is G two, and they live in a bloodbath. It's crazy to think of. It's very Vladimir. But at the end of the day, this is the sort of style that they want to play. And it's, I think the link between laners and jungler is stronger on the side of G2. It should again be mentioned, Xerxes has a bit of a different role. His role is mostly, all right, make sure the coast is clear for us to play a standard laning phase in multiple lanes. But the one time he actually went more aggressively in order to actually go and farm out his blue, he was actually caught by the aggression of the enemy side. So... Nice moment from G2, but I, I kind of focus on the splice side and, and wonder if they would, on their VOD review, workshop some different ways to actually get something out of what they had, which was a very nice pushing in bot lane wave that was surrendered to by Perks and Mickey before those champions, Gragas and Yasuo, had all of their, um, all of their abilities, right? They didn't have EQW yet. They only had a couple of abilities at the time. So it goes back to full clear, picking up his Krugs for the second time. And Caps already has a control ward. Like now the Hunters become the Hunted because at the end of the day, they're getting Vision down. Yankos can see Zerse in Vision. So the Vision advantage is now there for Yankos after he was already able to pick up the gank advantage. So it's, the amount of map control they have with just one forward ward knowing the Raptor respawn timer. To be clear, when the game goes the way it is, you know that Xerxes did a three camp clear topside, so you're very confident on when the respawn timer is going to be. 
on the uh, on the raptors. That's why the ward is placed at the right time. It's well played by Zerse. So you watch the play that happens here. Zerse re-enters the red side that he did not use to actually gank bot side. And this is a counter gank that happens. Now what I want you to notice here is consider how Perks and Mickey will be forced to play this lane if they don't have summoners up. They won't ever be able to take aggressive trades like they want to. Uh, this is them just going all in 2v2 because they don't respect the fact the enemy jungler could be there. And those sort of plays are impossible if they're forced to use their summoners earlier. They have a lot of kill pressure post-6 if summoners are down. And my thought is, the reason they go for this all-in, is they want summoners on cooldown from Splice's bot lane before Gragas Cask is up, because when Gragas Cask is up, it's basically a guaranteed kill in the 2v2. So they go for an all-in here, they look for the outplay, this time the jungler's there. But stopping Perks and Mickey from ever being able to take aggressive plays on the bot side is the bread and butter for a jungler against a awesome dude bot lane like the Gragas Yasuo. While they get the kill, they're not able to return to the red buff. They had control warded there. So Spice really want to control red side jungle. That's the dream for them is keeping wards up and keeping Sejuani out of her red side jungle because the spill on effect will be a couple of turret plates and more advantages to bot lane. It is really well played. Here's a quintessential G2 play. So bot side resets. Gragas goes straight to mid lane to try to find a gank. But... They're still very aware of the other tools they have on the map. Yes, Yankos is seen bot side, but the moment that Gragas comes into mid, spotted on a ward, Cersei, of course, has to walk up for the counter gank there. But G2's always thinking about where the next aggressive moment can be. So the moment that Cersei responds to this mid lane play, which I believe was spotted on the control ward, you'll see here. Yasuo might be level 5, but Lucian's summoners are down. We talked about how the all-in from G2 was done to get summoners down before their level 6s. Well, it doesn't actually incorporate the level 6 of the jungler. So while this is a 2v2 here, they have no more recent vision on Yankos. And even though he was spotted bot side, this is just really well done because it's a melee champion with a Sejuani. The moment he walks up, Permafrost Synergy is there, Ult is there. It's academic, it's straightforward, it's easy, but it's the difference between the two teams is that G2 always will look for a skill check, like the all-in from Perks and Mickey on Gragas Yasuo, and then the moment that happens, G2 says, there'll be a team kind of discussion where they're like, okay, what summoners are down? And Mickey will be able to say, Silas, Akali, Lucian, not the Lux. So three flashes are down, and they have a team comp with multiple melee champions who have strong synergy with Sejuani. So you can just do an error check like you're a computer algorithm and say, okay, if Lucian walks past the 50% mark of this lane, we can just kill him. It doesn't matter that I don't have the Yasuo ultimate. We have kill pressure on him. And they're always reevaluating where do we have kill pressure and how do we get that kill. It's never... Let's get to a point where we have three items and we'll be able to take over games. With G2's proactive style, with the 2019 meta style, it's always, all right, where is the next kill coming? And they're able to update that very reliably. And that's what they've been able to do in this scenario. It's a very simple thing, but just Gragas going mid for a gank and Sejuani going for a different gank bot lane because it's Yasuo and not a ranged AD carry. Like if Yasuo is to stay you know, Tristana or something in this play, you don't pick up the kill. But the permafrost guarantee into you're always going to hit a point-blank ult from Sejuani afterwards is why that play can happen. So it's nicely done um, from the side of G2.
And we're still looking at Kobe, not Kobe, sorry, and for, at Xerse on this Silas to make the game about something that Spice want to do. Because you can't just counter gank G2. There's many comps where a team will draft a comp like this where you can actually play a counter gank style as Sejuani. But when you're against multiple lanes with priority and kill threat from in multiple different ways, like there's many different types of 2v2 that G2 can inflict in order to pick up a kill, you can't just pick a lane to counter gank as the Silas. You need to be ahead of the play and creating plays of your own to actually force the enemy to come to you because you just don't have as many playmaking tools as G2 does. So in this case, it's top side is what the focus is on from the Silas just getting a scuttle, but almost loses a bot laner. Wanders winning trades up top lane, so maybe you need to be there for the GP. There's multiple different forest fires happening here for Splice where mid lane's going pretty well for them. Bot lane, whenever someone is down, is a bit of a disaster, like you're seeing already, with a just a deep ward being put down. And this is with no TP up. They're deathly afraid of if Sejuani or Grog is going to wrap around and look for an all-in. So already, Yasuo is getting a CS lead because the successful gank came in and because G2 has so many different ways to threat. And Xerse needs to be strong here. Like, I am sitting there criticizing him for the earlier play, <coughs> where, at th whoa, I'm losing my voice. One second. Huh. I'm sitting there criticizing him for the earlier play, where he doesn't make a decisive play on the bottom side of the map and doesn't get something going. And we're seeing, after that, he was kind of, by chance, in position to counter gank. He was actually focusing on the red side. But after that, he is happy footing a little bit. And it's that integration with the jungler where this season, I think Yankos has always felt like he's ahead of games. He's always been ahead of plays and he's been involved in such a high percentage, just a high number of kills. There's so many kills happening, both in solo and gank senses, that G2 sometimes feels like they have two junglers when Cap starts giving up minion waves and Yankos is also on point. But... I think that's a lot about the comms of G2 and their aggressive mindset, more than just about Yankos the God. And to be fair, Yankos has played very well in summer. Well, you see the plays from Xerse and... He's playing super defensively around top, which I don't really get. Like, in this play, where Zerse spots on a ward, he clears out Krugs, and then he recalls to stop there from being a, a turret dive top side. And the reason why this is relevant is, yes, Zerse is low on mana, but just showing up as a jungler at nine minutes when turrets do so much damage does a lot. You see the enemy jungler and suddenly like, oh crap, maybe we can't juggle this turret. Oh crap, maybe he'll stop us and stop our dive. But if you full recall here, yes, you're not in vision, but the only thing this does is that it means that Humanoid's going to lose two turret plates in mid. He's going to recall, shop, get a control ward, but the, the job is already done in terms of pressure because another minion wave is on the way and it's going to zone Humanoid from wave clearing under the turret it takes too long to get there like they are threatening a dive but the moment the humanoid backs away they're getting a plate and i feel like you need to use your kind of your position as the the jungler a little bit more on point in terms of where you are and what that's achieving so so say backs away he comes back up he's got two control wards so we'll see what he does with those but we're still not seeing Xerse forcing anything. We're very much seeing Xerse farm it out while G2 trying to work out the kinks in their engage. So let's talk about the play from the start here. So Cap says, I'm going to all in, I'm on the turret because he's too low. Throws out his ultimate. Silas responds to it. Yankos is ahead of the play and they get one kill, which is 
well played, all things considered. Like, Zerse, to his credit, is willing to walk up there. The play here from Yankos is super good. Like, that's a super good play. It's another one of these little pathing things where, yes, Humanoid is low. He has 150 health. But you just don't expect the Piggy to flash ult you. Which is super well played by Yankos. So right? he makes something happen. But also, at the same time, another kill happens. Like, a lot of stuff just happened in a row. So let's work out the important things that happen here, right? Because actually a lot happens. Like, so much happens. Let's walk through it all because it's such a mouthful. So Zerse picks up his blue. That's the start of the play. You know, just warding out, doing his thing. Now, interestingly, you'll notice the... How does that happen? Do you guys know why this happens? Why is the zombie ward spawning there? Is that a spectator bug? Let's see if they get a ping on this to find out. So, I'm guessing that's a spectator bug. Probably a spectator bug, right? So if you look what happens, let's watch the pings, right? On the way, there's an assist ping. Now, the only reason that they don't know for certain, that they're not for certain seeing him on vision, is that it could be that that's the only camp up and they're expecting him to be on it because they know that he's clear topside. So that doesn't necessarily mean that they um, saw him on a ward on this particular case. It happens if you use the vision plan as ward is dying soon. Vision score of 13. Wait, I guess we have to pause it. What's their vision score? 5, 13, 3, 3, 7. So, 5, 13, elite. Five thirteen lead. All right. All right. Close the cell out, please, LEC. I need to know. Five thirteen three three seven. So Yasuo in the bot lane did something. So it, there's no real way that. It did there. Now, the, again, the only thing I'll say, because I'm not actually clear on why this happens at this point. The six is Victor, though. Like, Wander didn't kill that ward, right? Like, there's a chance, just to be clear to you guys, let's say it's a visual bug. It's also possible that Yankos just read the jungle path because he's question marks and pings onto the camp he's most confident they're on. So it's not 100% that they actually see this. But the reason why this play is relevant is the counter gank comes in, they get the first kill on caps, being a little bit over-aggressive, that's a good play. Something else here also happens that isn't actually directly referenced in the play-by-play -play because nobody's looking bot lane. Also, what happens in this play is that Gragas and Yasuo post-6 with Exhaust Ignite up just saw the Sejuani. So if you watch the mini-map as this play happens... They see the enemy jungler, and if you watch on the minimap, Gragas and Yasuo instantly all in onto Lux and Lucian because they see the Sejuani there and they know they're under no threat with someone who's still on cooldown for Kabe. So that's the thing that also happens here is that G2, either by a crazy zombie ward or the smart invasion from Yankos, get in there. And the Yankos' path is, let's turret dive and or catch the, the Silas in his jungle. 
So it's about making sure they have exact positioning on enemy mid laner and enemy jungler. And just that action means that it's a 2v2 bot lane where Yasuo and Gragas have Exhaust, Ignite, and Cask Up. And that's, again, something that G2 is so good at, is that the moment that they see that Sejuani and Silas are at the same part of the map, they instantly all in at bot lane at the same time. So a lot happens in this play, but G2 have set it up that they're going to absolutely be setting up like four dominoes when a breeze is coming and at least three of them are going to crash down they get priority top side they trade one for one while getting information in the mid and they get a killer bot and all those things happen at the same time at 10 minutes and that's that's g2 and that's what i believe league should be played at this level is that whenever you do aggressive things the enemy has to react to you and other objectives slip out from there you know like you get the enemy jungler's flash suddenly your bot lane can all in easier you kill the enemy jungler suddenly your top lane is fine to 1v1 like those are the sort of things that are possible uh in the game as it is right now there's a good tp from humanoid but unable to actually get the kill but this sort of pressure that g2 apply like the fact that they can make this play here right this is going to be the bot lane play so we'll watch this they know they can just walk up and get a kill like there's no chance they're ever going to get out of here mickey holds on to cask because yasuo is able to get the knock up and that means it's there for flash but this play here where we can now all in in mid lane all in and top and victor can just use all all in a mid lane, all in a bot, and Victor can just hard push top lane and not be worried. Like, you need to be a team playing on the Razor's Edge to have that much map control. But do notice that all three plays on the map are made by G2. And the Silas, who has been trying to counter gank one lane at a time and also farm up and scale, actually is involved in this play, but only as a response and can't impact the two side lanes. And again, that plays to our idea that G2 want to make this game chaos and play through multiple areas. And Xerxes' first job as a jungler is to counter gank and baby his team through the lanes and make it a lot more of a long laning phase, a lot more predictable, and just usher in kind of a, a team fight phase or a phase where they're very comfortable knowing their power level. And that's just not what a team like G2 will ever allow. So this is super aggressive coming through from G2, so from uh, Splice. And that's the sort of play that G2 often makes, but G2's ahead of this play as well. We watch the resets once again, and Gragas going straight to mid lane just to be there for a gank or a counter gank means that he's also able to repel this play. Well played. Uh, this is the sort of pace that Splice as a team can often find it difficult dealing with. Like, they really want the game to be a lot more predictable. I thought against Fnatic, they were very smart in the early game and had some really nice counter punches. But in this particular game, like, they're getting run around by the G2 show. But to be fair, most teams in the world get run around by the G2 show. Only deep ward is on the red buff that they know that are respawning, so G2 feel confident to push up in top. No discernible CS lead for Lucian in the lane. Like, if you try to point to where Splice own the map, and when it comes to the Baron, this is going to be very important. So going forward, whether you're thinking about where this review has been, or just the game as it flows on to the next kind of 8 minutes, or I guess 10, 15 minutes, is always think about how much of the map and where, and try to identify it in your head, maybe draw down on a diagram, where does Splice own the map? What is Splice control territory? Because when we see three lanes making proactive plays that all suit the team of G2, you could argue all three lanes are areas that they're working around. They're getting deep vision in. 
What is owned both by Vision and, say, Champion 1v1 or 2v2 ability by Splice? Because we know the rest is owned by G2. And that's something that I was thinking about a lot because I kind of watched this game mostly looking at minimap is where was Splice ahead at any moment? G2 had the deep ward downs. So they see Silas walking over the red. They get the charge in. They know Cap's going to be able to pick up the gold. Can they get the kill on Humanoid? No, but you just look at the differences and what their teams are doing. Like, Victor's playing 1v1 bot side. Yankos knows that they have vision on Xerxes roaming down, so they'll definitely get a charge in. They can give all the gold towards Caps. Maybe they can get a kill along the way because Mickey's there first. Meanwhile, we saw... Lux and, and Silas just walking the most defensive way through the jungle because they don't own the rotation through their red side jungle. Here's an update. Thank you very much to Datboy2001. Don't know if he looked at Proview, but the zombie ward at Splice's blue buff came from after Lucian was killed bot lane. Lux wards the brush and Yankos uses the vision plan to reveal the ward. When the war died, he still got a takedown on it, just in case you're interested. So, thank you very much to Datboy2001 for the update there. So that's a quirk of the vision plant on words and having Zombie Ward. Huh. Feels like Zombie Ward is... I didn't realize that's how it worked when it came to takedowns, when it was that generous in terms of how long after the fact. Like maybe Riot looked at changing that. But that actually allowed their play to be even more on point, and it would have allowed Gragas and Yasuo to push up and all in even safer in the bot side. Now, they eventually saw the enemy Silas, so it was still safe, all things considered, but earlier timing available because of the zombie ward. Bizarre how some of the interactions work. Gragas and Yasuo are now CS for CS. They'd have very little respect for top side. Like, it's very suffocating playing against these G2 style. Whether you have a lead in the early game or not, like, SKT had some good early game leads against, say, the Pike comp, but then G2 turned on their suffocating style where they have so much ability to play multiple lanes, and you just look at things like this where... Like, you can't defend everywhere. They're sending everything topside. You watch the play. Gragas walks up, contests Vision, Lux is there. Xerxes spotted on one ward here. Suddenly Kiana knows she can walk up and they can contest blue buff, they can contest more. Xerxes is going to be shown again on a second ward, on a third ward. Like, Xerxes is not top, but what is the information that the other side of the map happens? We always talk about cross-map plays. Consider this game from GP's perspective. He can't see Sejuani. We know Sejuani is on the back. As from, from the GP perspective, he walks up. He can't see his blue buff, so he's very afraid of being turret dived. He thinks that Sejuani is around. I believe he pings him out. But now Sejuani is walking straight to his blue buff that he can't contest. And he knows that Xerxes is spotted on the top side. And he's going to lose his bot lane turret. So think about how G2's play here is Gragas Yasuo walking up to test Splice. Seeing multiple enemies and saying, okay, I guess we can't get advantages there. But they just call for Yankos and Caps to get advantages bot side. And they're always going to win around those because they always have the first, the first rotation. They always have more members. And that reverse information is not there. So they're playing around team calm so well. All with the mindset of getting more rather than allowing the game to go so long. So... Really good comms here, and one of the reasons that G2's style is so difficult to imitate is that the synergy of this team, having been in their team house and seen them interact, like, they really are close friends who joke and rage against each other, but are always there for each other, and their comm structure from listening in has always been strong. And I don't always have the best analogy for this. After they lose blue buff, like, again in this play, just so you guys know, Splice got to push in one extra wave top lane and they lost blue buff Mountain Drake out of bot lane turret already. They already lost an insane amount on the bot side from Silas showing top side. 
So like there are three objectives for zero, not even one objective. Perks can even stop a back. He even gets to be a jerk on top of the three objectives they get. But look at what happens from there. Yankos comes straight mid lane. Yes, he misses the ultimate. Two, misses, two ults go wide. But G2 also threaten a kill on Humanoid if the skill shots are a little bit more on point. They actually get a kill there as well. So they would have got five objectives if you include the interrupting the back as an objective. All this time, Splice can only get one reset on Lucian, who's 500 gold down on his enemy in lane. So when it comes to our pre-match kind of hypothesis about what these teams are about, we are seeing G2 get more and more and more. And Splice just haven't been able to make cross maps to get areas where they win. It's another proactive play from G2 where they're getting a summoner while Xerxes is clearing out. So like one team is using their jungler as the kind of fulcrum of the comp. And it's like the quarterback going around getting something everywhere because the comms and the priorities are so clear. The enemy jungler is just trying to stave off the inevitable, it feels like, on the side of Splice. It's a pleasure to watch games like this because it reminds you that League of Legends can be played this way. Mid lane's pushing in, bot lane's pushing in. Top side has pressure even though Silas was there. And they have control ward advantage in the river. Like G2 have everything in this game. But the game's not over. And we know they make a throw from here. The own hubris can get to the side of G2, right? Like they don't play every moment perfectly. So Xerse has spent all his time top side for the longest time. He never made those plays bot side. And it's actually a really big mistake from Xerse because he reinvades his red side jungle where blue buff was stolen, where Mountain Drake was taken, where Caps has kill pressure onto the GP. He reinvades thinking that he can come down and help ward. And he also does this. Like, there's two ways you can approach this. If I'm Xerse and I'm like, okay. I haven't gone red side for a long time, or blue side, I should say, for a long time. GP's getting pushed in. We lost a lot of objectives there. I need to help out the GP so he can safely farm and scale. Then I'm trying to get a ward here. I'm trying to get a ward maybe here and clearing the blast plant. But walking straight into the river with no priority and never going bot lane is what actually ends up happening, which I think is super bold. Like, Vizitashi already has... Very safe wards. And honestly, Chachi's going to be playing around here anyway. So waddling down as Xerse here is pretty full int, in my opinion. Like the best case scenario there is you get a ward here or you blow a flash. Like you're not going to get a kill onto the Kiana who already has one and a half items. Oh, caps. Because now Chachi dies because of your over-aggressive path to put down vision. And that was blind as well. I actually was able to pull up pro view during this game when I watched and I did check. It's shown in the replay here. I'll get show you guys in the replay, but it's a blind flash route coming through from, uh, from the play. Let's watch what happens in the minimap during this play, by the way. Yeah, Kiyasu pushes out mid. They get shove in the mid lane. Yes, they sacrifice top side so that if a bigger team fight happens, they're going to get the win. If you're wondering why don't Gragas and Yasuo go top side, like you might think this is troll, right? Because outer mid lane turret is down as this play happens. So you might think, wait, G2, why didn't you go top side? Do we know in chat why Gragas Yasuo went mid? Like, why did Gragas Yasuo go mid lane when out of top lane turret is already taken down and give up a pretty healthy turret? Stronger side, that's one of the reasons. The wave is there is another reason. There's actually another reason on top of that. Hasn't been mentioned by chat, but when they make this reset, because you consider when the reset is happening, right? We go all the way back. Gragas Sejuani coming through. They notice that Silas is topside. 
they say they notice that Silas is bot side, and that's when they Sejuani commits to picking up a kill. Notice the map state here. Humanoid is resetting going mid with teleport. Kobe is top lane with teleport. And Noskaren doesn't have teleport. Gragas and Yasuo have no teleports between them. G2 go mid lane to push out so that if there's a team fight with teleports, they're going to be able to respond to bot lane and actually get there. Because if they go top lane, TP is actually going to lead to an out number and G2 will die. So that's the reason why they make the play is they go mid lane to push out and so they can respond in the bot lane without teleports. So they don't want to play to Splice's teleport advantage, and they want to make the play about them, and that's why they do this. So that's the reason that they go mid lane here, because yes, they end up getting a bonus kill on Akali, but the play here is to back up the all-in on bot side much more than it is to like push in a minion wave on an inner turret. Like, they don't care anymore about out a top lane turret. When they're able to pick up two kills, it eventually becomes three. They have three kills. They get in a turret because they're playing around vision and things like that. Really well done by uh, G2 in this particular play when it comes to playing a map. And it's another case of it not just being mindless aggression. They have a mindless aggression moment in this game. We get it very shortly um, when it comes to them brawling for too long on this blue side. But here's the, pro the replay. It's not a pro view, right? If you look at the minimap here, they, that's the cool thing. They toggle vision here. It actually is a blind TP. There's no TP indicator. And Caps hits the flash hole. I, I checked in ProView to confirm this because they didn't have the ProView sign at the top. It is actually a, a blind route there from Caps, which this ends up making it a bonus kill. And now the gold lead is huge, right? It's like 4,500 gold. How many Yasuo's would go IE second and pro not Sterex? Splice actually have no tanks. And Windwall does a lot of a lot of work dropping their damage. So this is actually a pretty good game to go IE second. I think Sterex is often defaulted into when the fights are going to be extended. But given that Lux, Akali, Lucian, Silas, GP are all squishy, I actually don't hate IE second um, coming through from the Yasuo. Okay, Mickey died. Let's watch how that happened. So this time for once, G2 doesn't have deep vision. And Mickey's just too cute. That's well played by Splice. Like, these are the sort of counter ganking plays that, that Silas was trying to repel earlier in the game. But wasn't actually in position to do so. They get a full team rotation. And this is where G2 gets pretty full int. Let's talk about how this starts. Like G2 decide to fight when Mickey is dead, which with the amount of gold they have could work. But also the thing to consider is they haven't swept out all vision and the t flank teleport comes in. So we watch the replay of how this play happens. The moment that Yankos comes in just to contest a blue. Like this is one where when this goes wrong, G2 has to, someone has to remind G2, like for sure it's Grabs, who's saying... What are we fighting for here? Because they're only fighting for blue buff. Yasuo's not even in ult range as the play starts, and the minion wave is pretty far away when it comes to getting an inner turret. So they go all in on this play and end up just getting screwed from multiple different angles. Like, Humanoid can come in for the flank before Yasuo is there. As the play goes on, they're chasing super deep, but they can't contest as they back into the base, so Humanoid gets a really easy access to the back line. And it's kind of just bread and butter. Like, Mickey can't be there. He doesn't have teleport or anything like that. Well played by Xerxes. He gets the stun from the stolen ultimate into further CC. And perks, you know, low value Yasuo ultimate. Just taken down. And I think when G2 were developing, there were more plays like this where, what are we fighting for? Is kind of like the thing you shout out if you um, set up for these plays. But at the end of the day, um, like G2, to their credit, like we've shown multiple times where they were making really smart timing attacks. 
like, this was just a dumb timing attack. Like, this is definitely something that um, needs to be reevaluated from the G2 from the G2 side. But it also was after they'd already done a lot of the hard work. And at the end of the day, it ends up being two two for two with Drake, which you know isn't ideal when you're four and a half thousand gold ahead, but isn't a straight up loss either um, on that side. Two for two, three v five, and Drake, in my opinion, worth Kappa. I mean, the Kappa part has to be there, but if G2 is just looking to style on people, like you can just ignore this. Don't even bother VOD reviewing it. But if you're looking to work out the small times where your aggression is a double edged sword, there aren't many refinements required for G2 to be close to flawless, right? So you take the ones where you can get them. So the map reset happens, and this is where things start to get interesting vision side. So they were caught with their pants down deep on the bot side, and now the vision clearing happens. They clear in the mid lane. Humanoid and Lux can't clear in front of them, so Yankos gets a ward down. Three control wards in the inventory. So right now, if you look, G2 has Baron control ward. They have five control wards in inventory. And they have priority in mid and top because no one's gone bot lane. Uh, Wanda could go bot lane, but he's focusing on top side because it gives Baron control. Meanwhile, Spice have three control wards and the ability to push bot side. Remember the amount of control wards because these are the things that make it so important when you're setting up for Baron. With the priority, they have mid lane. G2 clear out a control ward. They put down a spotting ward. They now have control over the Raptor area. The ward in the pit is cleared out. They start Baron and Spice are wise to it. So this time it's just a cunning ruse. They're taken down. But with this much spotting ward, control ward in front, control ward on the spotting brush and a ward on the entrance coming in from red buff, Sejuani and Yasuo can try Baron, see what happens and back away. And at minimum, you get information and something like a blue trinket that we know has a really long cooldown. So now they know blue trinket is down and there's three control wards left for Spice. This is a really good play though. Like Spice gets a punishment here. They don't, they use the blue trinket, but they actually make a very assertive roam through onto Caps and the slow into kill here gets Caps into a bit of trouble. So nice response there. You know that Spice was playing top side. Try, so G2 was playing top side, trying to get Baron Vision, get a pick in the mid lane. Well played to get a single kill, gets an inhibitor, sorry, a outer turret in the mid lane as well. But that's kind of like the maximum they're going to get, right? And they will lose vision on this latest um, vision exhaustion moment. This is well played. Like Vizitachi actually gets a relevant barrel slow there to pick up the kill. And there's no way for Caps to get out. So good kind of contest comes in. And they actually get a kill there. Noscaran comes to clear out vision. Again, because this game becomes about Baron Vision, we'll, we'll focus on that. Four control wards in inventory. Whenever they reset, like G2 are really consistent at finding these walls of control wards. We have eight control wards on a comp that has assassins and pick power. And whenever we get Kiana in the LCK, we often have the Kiana team farm it out and never get to play around Vision to look for an assassination. In this game where Gragas comes out of the brush, oh shit, might be the Yasuo joining him. Kiana comes out of the brush, oh shit, my health bar is gone. Sejuani comes out of the brush, oh shit, what am I going to do? Going to be stunned forever. And if Victor comes out of the brush, you're like, oh shit, we should have been pushing another lane. What's he doing grouped? Like, There's a lot of oh shits to deal with on the side of G2. And five control wards is a great way to set that up. Meanwhile, Spice on their back got four control wards, but they don't have one on everyone and they're already behind. So consider that at the end of the day, G2 have control over Baron River. They're going to have pushed forward vision. So they already have their control wards down and everyone has a bonus control ward in order to um, replace them. So if Spice ever comes up and contests, you can just replace them with your control ward and then Spice is in darkness and has to back. So 
Now, this control vision from ahead with pick champions, which is the champions G2 likes to play, champions that can fight, makes it so hard to deal with these game scenarios. Looked for a kill, had sweepers up, knew there wasn't going to be vision there. No kill happens, you back away. But it's another time where it becomes more and more untenable in order to hold the vision top side. They get spotting vision down. Like, this is the G2 we know. This is why their barons are reliable, even though they pick no sieging comps. Like, remember that G2 can either pick people because they face check the wrong brush or team fight around a baron or elder dragon. They can't siege. They have no siege on this comp. They have to dive if they look for a siege. And actually, Victor doesn't have the ability to push in a GP one-on-one. -on -one. So red side vision for G2 is god tier. They have no way to cheat when it comes to closing out this game. It has to be about a Baron. So every time they have these vision leads and have more vision to replace it, thus have like kind of a, a guaranteed war of attrition vision advantage in the red side jungle, their win condition is online. Meanwhile, Splice have multiple ways they can play this game, but without the vision, they're going to have to opt into team fights that suit G2. But this was the moment that gave, I think, Splice a lot of hope. Like we get to see in a side lane, and if you get the drop as Akali, which is what happens here, pops over the ward, gets down deep vo vision. Uh, this is a really good play from Humanoid just for vision, and then sees some cooldowns down and has one rotation. And there's no way for Caps to outplay with his ult down this scenario. He doesn't have the damage to answer, and the Zonias is there. So Spice actually had Humanoid in a position where 1v1, he could contain Kiana pretty well. And that was something that Splice would have to return to a couple of times in order to get the game going. And people are saying, oh yeah, 1 and 5, Akali, lol. All I'm saying is for the purpose of this game, Akali does have threat. Whether it's one rotation without a face check or not, it's still threat onto a, onto a Kiana. And that's with how the map state has been G2s the entire time. Something to look at and say, oh shit, let's try and recreate that and and comp around that and get a side push around that like humanoid in a side lane has kill pressure because akali is seen as a counter pick to yasuo so you already like akali versus yasuo akali already clearly has some pressure onto the kiana and you know against victor should have some pressure so humanoid should be the one that creates mismatches here it should be that G2 are afraid of who they can send against the Akali, and thus you can use that to outnumber in another part of the map and find a way to get some wards down that previously would be too hard because Akali seems relevant. So let's watch to see if Splice can create mismatches on the map around how powerful their teleport Akali is. They're in vision putting down wards, and Yankos just says, all right, I'll go and put down more vision on the top side. We'll take some resets here. There's no Baron threat from the side of Splice, so we forward from here. And once again, G2, they send a Kiana topside. He doesn't want to be near Akali. Uh, this actually suits Caps. Uh, Caps wants to be in the lane. The Akali isn't after we saw the solo kill. And while Yasuo is countered by Akali, Yasuo and Gragas together, Akali has no kill pressure on a duo. So with that, they're able to push up topside get deep vision once again in the area of the map they have to have it and make this game around Baron again. So the lane assignment here. So Cersei is putting down a control ward to spot, but it means that he's not actually top side to put down vision around Baron. So it's a little bit scary for him. However, setting up for your Akali who's got the split push advantage is not incorrect. We're just trying to spot whether Cersei can actually create a game state that doesn't suit you too. Like Spice have no ability to push up aggressively in their jungle right now. Three, three control wards in the inventory from Spice. Deep wards go down. Blasting Plant is going to be taken on. He's trying to escort Vizichachi to minion waves is, is Splice. Like... Cersei knows where he needs to be on the map, puts down his control ward. He starts his back early because he knows he has to put down another control ward. He's backing just to buy control wards there, as Cersei.
Alt's used to check, blue trinket on cooldown. Everyone has control wards now from Spice. They're definitely on red alert. Let's pause at this moment. So, lots of control wards. They've got seven. All the vision already placed by G2, but they don't have vision to replace that. So if Spice can actually get their wards down, the best G2 can do is clear them. They can't really replace them with new wards because they don't have any wards available. But G2 has all of this map control around the red side jungle, which is around the Baron where they know they need to play. Akali, no one from Splice, so no one from G2 is sent to contest the Akali, which I think is another sign of G2 being very intelligent, is they don't send anyone. They don't send Yasuo to try to contend with the Akali. Doesn't really make sense. Doesn't have teleport. And we already talked about how Akali is a winning matchup there. Kiana already got smacked around by Akali and doesn't have teleport, so they don't send her there. Victor can only do so much and kind of stave off the pain against um, the Akali, but can help with the push in mid and top. So groups with them there. And G2 are grouping very proactively to still get the Baron because you know that no one's been able to place vision from the side of Splice. Blue Trinket's still up, so they've got that for Kobe. So Lux ults on cooldown. Blue Trinket is up. But by the time the Blue Trinket goes down, the Baron is dead. Let's go back in time and talk about something here. Let's go back a few minutes. So it's going to be a bit low quality for a bit. So when this happens, which let's upgrade it to 1080p. It's 26 minutes into the game. They get a solo kill and realize how strong their Akali is. And they've got a piece that Spice knows they can use. Spice now know, let's play through Akali in a side lane, have Zerse put down some control wards, and we'll be able to force G2 to respect how strong our Akali is. At 26 minutes, that would have been their call. Let's try and talk about what G2 do in the time after that. G2 reset. They take down a bit of vision around a Drake. They're going to give up a Cloud Drake. They don't really care about that. They never want to allow Akali alone, but the moment that Akali is parked bot side, they realize that if Akali is going to stay bot, why not take over top side jungle? Because Akali is only going to teleport when Baron is started. So if they ever start Baron, they can bait out a TP, or if they never start Baron in vision, or the enemy team doesn't know how low the Baron is, Akali's ability to trade one for one or beat people in the 1v1 doesn't matter. So we're two minutes later, and already, G2 is sending everyone to take over red side jungle in order to allow them to play Baron side and to no longer care about what the Akali represents. Like, Victor walks bot lane, and this is, again, two minutes after the solo kill, and says, all right, well, I can't deal with this Akali. I can't go down lane. Let's just run straight at the Baron and make the play around Baron. So you notice Victor is giving away absolutely nothing. He backs... He runs towards Baron. And the moment that Humanoid goes bot lane actually condemns this spot where G2 have made the game about what they can do. This game is not about we can't fight against Akali, therefore we're forced into doing things. G2 say, well, our team comp is about skirmishing. We cannot siege, so we don't need to play three lanes. We're about skirmishing and fighting and turning around Baron. Why don't we just go run into the red side jungle where all those good things are most likely to happen and see if we can just take a Baron. And they just count things like control wards, blue trinkets, other things like that. And it becomes about what G2 is rather than about what Splice is. Splice right now is Akali is really strong. G2 right now is let's look for a team fight. And four minutes later from a bad moment from G2, they get a free Baron because Splice has just been too safe at trying to contest it. They're respecting a Gragas in a bush. They're respecting a Sejuani in a bush. And all that respect allows G2 to bloodlessly pick up Baron. From a solo kill that should have been Splice's advantage to a bloodless Baron in a four-minute passage where no one else died is why G2 is the complete team. Because they're not just about, we'll flex on you at your blue side and outplay you with sick mechanics. They can also... 
look at incomplete information, look at a scenario where there's no categoric correct thing to do for either team and get the most from it. And that's what's so impressive to me about this play from G2. Like, you shouldn't be able to set up map control when your side laner Kiana is 1v1 solo killed and the enemy Akali that's 1v1 against her has TP advantage. But that's what they did. And it was much less about Splice's misplay around that area. I think my take is that misplaces were historic. I thought that they were too far behind in how the map was being played in the first 15 to 20 minutes with Silas unable to create a strong side of the map. That I guess we shouldn't be surprised that G2 recreated a strong side of the map that should have been lost after the solo kill by Akali that was very reminiscent of what G2 created in the early game. Like, they, they lost the ability to just control three quarters of the map the moment they were solo killed, but they could recreate it from a really smart vision play around the Baron. Like, it's a really cool play from G2. That's some reactive shot calling to go along with their proactive shot calling. The kills on the back end of that, obviously, are much less interesting. Silas Holt used. And G2 now have the Baron. They don't have Siege. They don't want to play in one lane. That's why Wanda's pushing up. And they're able to create this scenario. The funny thing is, like, Yankos, sorry, Wanda pushing up alone creates pressure, draws two people, and it means that we don't have any more team fights. Like, G2 can dive. They just can't team fight 5v5. They can't siege 5v5 as easily because Spice have no incentive to fight against them. But just a play like this where they draw people out of attention, like, look at Perks here. He sees two people line up. And the combat text is insane. And they just win. What a pleasure to watch this game. I really loved watching this game live. Because it was such a macro masterclass. Masquerading as LOL G2 Flexen. Like, we all know that Splicer are a really good team. But G2 knew Splicer's tendencies in this game and played against them through how they approached the jungle pathing path and the early game. Like, you noticed that a lot of G2 setups bore fruit. And we had moments where three lanes were able to do things at once. Meanwhile, the approach from Splice where it came to kind of stem the bleeding, which is very often their way. They like to farm till they're safe. Um, and feel strong. Like the approach of just come top lane relief pressure and then now come bot lane relief pressure doesn't work when all three lanes are being aggressively moved on at the same time. But also, it, it means that you're always marching to the beat of G2's drum. And that's what I felt about Zerse this game. He was always following what G2 wanted to do. So even in the small scenarios where they had a strong side, I don't think G2 ever really felt it outside of Zerse's kind of chance counter gank bot lane when he went to steal away a red buff. And then the kind of ignominy of getting a solo kill at 26 minutes and then having that completely subverted bloodlessly four minutes later with a free Baron was not just something that happened in this game. It was the accumulation of three lanes always feeling like they were potentially going to be all in to any moment and that Xerxes can only be one place at once. For a whole game, if all three laners feel that way, something's going to slip. And it was vision control around Baron at a really critical time. But that wasn't Splice's mistake. It wasn't an unforced error. I see that as a forced error from how aggressive G2 were about finding ways to make this game about what they wanted to do and not being interested about a Fed Akali they couldn't deal with. So... That's my take on, on G2 versus Splice. I think it was a pretty rewarding game to track minimap-wise, both the play with the zombie ward around the blue buff where Yasuo Gragas got their level 6 all in, and the Baron play with more context I thought was, was super interesting um, to track.
people said I want to watch Perks go crazy. Does he really go crazy here? Seems pretty comfortable. I'll watch the closeout. They seem pretty happy. They should be. G2 is really good. Pack up your stuff. Really good team performance by G2. Sort of game where I find it really hard to give an MVP. It'd probably be Yankos in this game. Um, yeah, Yankos or Mickey um, will probably be my MVP in this game. I will not play Sichuani again, says Yankos. Well, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. It makes the assassins even stronger. But um, this is a cool series. I think G2 are a very impressive team. And it's why I like to review them because they set a bar as to what is possible in the 2019 meta. And I look to my teams in Korea to at least pick up snippets of the good things that G2 does. And yes, those teams I have in Korea are largely very different. But every team in the world can learn from G2 right now. But there's always something more to learn. And uh, we learn together with them. So thank you very much to everybody for watching this VOD review between G2 and Splice. Going to take a short break, play some ads, come back with some final questions, and then we're going to close out the stream. So thank you very much for watching my LEC review.